Hello, everyone. So I'm Francois. I do deep learning research at Google. And I'll be talking about applying deep learning to mathematical reasoning. So hopefully, it will be uh, interesting to at least some of you. Um, so I'd like to start with uh, a question, which I think is a question that's been uh, asked around a lot uh, at this conference. So what's the most important uh, research problem in AI today? So as you know, uh, deep learning is a pretty mature technology now. We can solve many, many problems that seemed impossible just 10 years ago, uh, specifically you know, computer vision, uh, machine perception. But at the same time, we're still very, very far from uh, human-level AI. Right? There are still many more things about intelligence that we do not understand and things that we do understand. So the question is, what, what's next? What is going to be the uh, next big uh, stepping stone on the way to AI? So I'll give you my answer, which uh, may not be the right answer, uh, or may not be uh, the only answer. Uh, I think the biggest unsolved problem today in AI is abstraction and reasoning. So that may seem a bit vague, so I'm going to uh, do my best to convey exactly what I mean by that. Essentially, I think today all machine learning algorithms, and, uh, including deep learning, are only just doing pattern matching. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. There's one thing that's wrong with pattern matching, which is that just by scaling up pattern matching, by just adding more layers, you know, building more powerful models and exposing them to more data, uh, just by scaling up pattern matching, you will not get to true AI. You will not get to human level um, intelligence. Um, so sometimes this is an argument that's being made that just, you know, by, um, that we are on track to getting to human level AI. We just need to keep doing what we're already doing and just, you know, uh, use, use bigger GPUs and add more layers. That's not actually the case. So there's one fundamental distinction between uh, pattern matching, so our current approach in intelligence, and uh, that difference is the power of generalization. So pattern matching, almost by definition, can only generalize very locally. That's why it's, uh, it's pattern matching. And so that's why that basically it means um, if, you're, if you're doing pattern matching, you, are, you have some input space X, you have some target space Y, and you're trying to learn a mapping from X to Y. And uh, this is going to require essentially a dense sampling of the X cross Y space. So that's why you need to train your deep learning models with lots of training examples, with lots of data. So on the other hand, if you look at humans, they can learn new concepts from very few examples. So they, they can generalize in a very powerful way from very little data. And that um, allows people, you know, humans, to do things like long-term planning and uh, formal reasoning which are uh, very much out of reach for machine learning algorithms. And the reason why is basically because uh, intelligent beings like humans, they work by uh, developing and manipulating abstract models of the situation they're they faced with. Um, so that's different from just learning a mapping from X to Y. So to kind of try to make things more concrete, and give you a better idea of this distinction between pattern matching and uh, abstract reasoning. I will give you a couple examples. So first example, imagine you're trying to get a rocket to the moon. So you're trying to figure out the right design for your rocket, and you're trying to figure out uh, proper uh, launch parameters. So you could try to solve this problem with deep learning. Essentially, you would, uh, you would start out by hard coding the problem setting, you know, the concept of a rocket, and you would, um, parameterize this problem. You would figure out a set of parameters to optimize. And then you would uh, try to learn the relationship between, uh, between these input parameters and the outcome of your rocket launch, you know, whether or not you get to the moon. And um, this would require essentially so a dense sampling of the data manifold that you're trying to learn. So you, whether or not you're uh, approaching the problem with supervised learning, or you could also you know, try reinforcement learning. In any case, uh, you would need many, many training examples. So we need to launch uh, thousands of rockets and do gradient descent until you figure out um, a, a, a design for a rocket that works and, uh, and uh, launch parameters that work. So that's very much unlike the way a human would approach a problem or you know, society as a whole. So what we would do is actually uh, come up with an abstract formal model of the problem you know, the laws of physics. 
uh, engineering and so on. And then we would use this abstract model to derive an exact solution, like exact launch parameters. And we would validate our assumptions, so validate our model using very few trials. And so we're able to get a rocket on the moon using uh, very few rockets, very few trials. So it's much more economical. So that's the fundamental distinction between pattern matching, where you just have you know, some input parameters. You want to get to some targets. You're just trying lots of things. You're trying to learn the relationship between your inputs and your outputs in a very uh, empirical fashion. You can only learn things that you directly experience. And the human approach, so the more abstract approach, where you come up with a model and you use very, very few trials to um, refine your model. So that's why, essentially, uh, abstract reasoning gives you this uh, extreme generalization power compared to pattern matching, which can only do uh, local generalization. So another example, uh, learning to uh, act um, in a way that the child, you, you do not get hit by a car. Like learn uh, avoidance behaviors when you're in a, in a risky situation, when, when, you, got, when you have a, a car um, uh, coming at you. So if you have a, a deep learning model, and that could be a supervised model, it could be a reinforcement learning model, uh, what you would need to do is essentially learn a mapping between uh, your policy space, you know, the, the actions you can take, and the outcome, so dying or not dying. That would be like your reward function. And so that would require you to actually die many, many times, experience death many, many times, uh, in order to, to learn kind of the data manifold, the relationship between behavior and outcome. And humans, on the other hand, remarkably, they typically manage to learn to not get hit by a car, to avoid cars without having to die, you know, even once. And uh, there are many factors at play, but essentially it boils down to the fact that uh, humans manipulate abstract models of their surrounding, which allowed them to learn from more than their own experience. They don't need to experience getting hit by a car to imagine what getting hit by a car would, would feel like, would be like. Um, they can learn from what other people tell them. They can learn uh, just from um, predicting what would happen. Uh, you know, if you, if you see a car hitting something, you can probably predict what, what would happen if it were hitting you. Uh, you can learn from reading things and so on. So you can learn from many different sources of information other than uh, direct experience. And the reason that's possible is because you're manipulating abstract models instead of just, you know, learning a direct mapping between what you're feeling, what you're seeing, and what you're doing. So that's the difference between pattern matching and abstract reasoning. So, it may seem a bit like I'm bashing uh, machine learning and deep learning, but actually, uh, I really don't want to downplay the significance of deep learning. I think uh, being good at pattern matching is uh, hugely important. So deep learning in particular um, is extremely important because it makes uh, pattern matching much easier. Like a few years ago, if you were to solve a problem with machine learning, not only was pattern matching the only approach you had available you, you had actually to do half of the work yourself, half of the pattern, match, of the pattern matching work yourself. You had to uh, hand engineer features. And deep learning met, makes actually this uh, pattern matching approach much easier to deploy because it, it automates uh, uh, the learning of features. But there is uh, one thing to keep in mind is that just by uh, doing more of what we're currently doing, just by scaling up deep learning, which is a pattern matching approach, you are not going to get to uh, human level intelligence. To get to human level intelligence, uh, you need uh, reasoning and abstraction. You need the concept of an abstract model that you're manipulating with formal rules. And um, that was actually the very first uh, approach to AI that people had you know, many decades ago. And currently, uh, this is not uh, an approach um, that's being uh, much investigated by anyone. It's really fallen out of favor. And I feel like maybe we've, uh, we've thrown out um, the baby with bathwater uh, when, uh, when adopting deep learning and, and you know, suddenly forgetting about decades of, uh, of previous research. And I, I feel like uh, symbolic AI might, might actually make a comeback in the next few years. And um, one thing you should keep in mind is that if you ever see instances of deep learning models that look like they are doing reasoning, that look like they are doing uh, long-term planning and uh, that look like they're manipulating abstract models and understanding something, like understanding language. Actually, they are not. It's just a bunch of magic tricks. What they're actually doing is pattern matching. 
but uh, because it's, uh, it's pattern matching trained on uh, a very large data set, typically, it can somewhat generalize. It can locally generalize. So things like um, if you see a deep learning model uh, able uh, of generating captions for a scene, for an image, for a video, it's actually just matching uh, you know, patterns, textures, shapes uh, in frames of your video or in your image to blobs of uh, English language. It's not actually understanding the contents of the scene. It's not doing any sort of reasoning of the contents. It's just locally generalizing from data it's been exposed to. It's just doing better matching. And uh, when, uh, when you're dealing with uh, more advanced systems, like some question answering systems, some uh, digital assistants, uh, they seem like they are really understanding the questions you're asking. So actually, typically, this is solved with uh, hard-coded rules. So in this case, there is an abstract model, but it's actually a model that's been, that's been provided by human programmers and, uh, and human engineers, human designers. So it, it hasn't learned you know, any form of, uh, of model for manipulating English language. Um, and sometimes these, uh, these hard-coded systems are augmented with deep learning to solve very specific problems, like speech, speech recognition, for instance. Okay, so deep learning does not actually do reasoning. If you see uh, people pretending like it does, they are typically just uh, leveraging the fact that pattern matching, because it can locally generalize, can give you the illusion that it's doing reasoning. It's actually not. And the reason you know uh, it's not doing any sort of real reasoning is because this generalization is really local. So uh, the systems are going to break down in horrible ways very, very easily, like captioning systems, for instance. And uh, on the other hand, humans are able uh, to uh, generalize on an extreme level so from just a few data points. It can make uh, very uh, long-term, very complex predictions. So by this point, I hope you're convinced that uh, resigning and abstraction are big problems in AI. And you're convinced that uh, our current approach, machine learning, deep learning, uh, do, not tackle deep le uh, do not tackle abstraction and reasoning at all. So, question is, how do we uh, move forward? How do we tackle reasoning and abstraction? So we need to find, essentially, a, a playground to test new ideas and new approaches. And I think a good playground is mathematics. So why? First, because it's a significant problem. It's not a tire problem. It's not trivial. It's also pretty useful. And it's useful uh, far beyond just helping mathematicians or automating the job of mathematicians. It's useful for more than mathematics. In particular, if you're able to do um, far more mathematical reasoning, uh, you can probably also do programming. So you can start uh, generating correct software uh, to solve problems. You can also uh, start uh, verifying the correctness of existing software. Um, so you can automate the job of software engineers. So that's very valuable. Um, also because uh, it's a purely symbolic problem. So there is no perception component. So why that's important is because if you're dealing with um, systems that require uh, reasoning, but that also have a perception component, like captioning, for instance, uh, or in a manipulating language. Um, the problem is that sometimes you can get better, uh, but you're not sure if it's, if it's because you're getting better at perception, so which is essentially pattern matching, or because you're getting better at reasoning. So it's actually much easier to tell if you're doing progress if you just get perception out of the picture entirely. And another good property of mathematics is that it's progressive. And by that, I mean that you can start out with very simple problems, and then you can uh, gradually scale them up, uh, get to more, more complex problems in a, in a very uh, incremental fashion. And so that's good uh, for experimentation. That's good for learning. So um, just a few words about uh, where we currently stand with regard to uh, artificial reasoning uh, and systems that can, do, um, uh, that can process mathematics. So we have essentially two branches. We have systems that work with humans, so ITPs, Interactive Theorem Provers. And then we have uh, completely automated systems, ATPs, which try to automate the job of mathematicians, essentially. So an ITP is typically processing higher order logic. So in a, in a, in a second, I will uh, go over what exactly higher order logic is. And uh, it's used by a mathematician. So the mathematician is interacting with the system to prove uh, new theorems. Um, and uh, in an ATP, you're actually uh, feeding into an algorithm a bunch of statements that you know to be true. And then you're feeding a conjecture that you want to prove 
and you leave the algorithm alone trying to figure out a proof. In our case, we'd be more interested in, uh, in ATPs, which primarily work with first order logic. So, and how, how these systems like ITPs and ATPs approach the problem is essentially just brute force, right? So, uh, in theorem proving, you're starting from statements that you know are true, uh, specified in first order logic or higher order logic, and you want to get to a target statement, right? And the way you do it is by combining existing statements that you know are true and uh, getting out uh, new statements that are also true. You know. And uh, you do this essentially uh, until you found uh, the statement you were looking for. And of course, this is combinatorial. So it's a combinatorial search process, essentially. And the um, only way we have to solve it is very dumb, which is the brute force search. And um, here's, uh, here's one way I think we can um, uh, tackle uh, mathematical reasoning. And this can actually be used as a template, as a blueprint uh, to generally you know, uh, solve reasoning, solve abstract modeling, at least, at least in the short term. It's to take um, an existing formal reasoning system, so something that does explicit search, that does uh, formal reasoning, and to uh, augment it with an intuition module. And this intuition module would be implemented using uh, pattern matching, so using essentially machine learning and deep learning. So essentially, you take a symbolic AI, but then you mix it up with uh, machine learning and deep learning to essentially give the system some intuition about the meaning of the symbols that it's manipulating, right? And um, this meaning com will come from pattern matching, essentially, you know, analogies, things like that. So augmenting uh, symbolic AI with an intuition module provided by deep learning. And so uh, I will uh, present um, a project that we did at, at Google with colleagues. So in particular, Christian Zegedi, uh, Geoffrey Irving, Alex Alemi, Sarah Loss, and Niklas N. Uh, and also uh, Josef Urban, um, who is uh, not a Googler, is from the uh, Czech Technical in Institute in, uh, in Prague, uh, is uh, one of the experts on, uh, on ATPs. So it's a deep mass project, which is essentially about taking this approach, so augmenting uh, a formal reasoning system with an intuition module provided by deep learning, and use it uh, to prove theorems, so to augment uh, an existing ATP with deep learning. So we call it deep math. So as you know, uh, if you're doing deep learning, uh, you can name your projects as a, either you know, deep something or something net. So we are hesitating between math net and deep math, went with deep math. Um, like, you know, you know, wave net, deep wave, deep voice, voice net, whatever. Okay, and um, so to attack the problem, first of all, uh, we need a data set and we need a benchmark to tell that we are uh, making progress to tell that we are beating some state of the art. And so we picked um, the MISA mathematical library. So the MISA library is a set of statements written in first order logic. So we'll see in a bit what first order logic is. Uh, we have uh, 58,000 statements. Um, they are written by humans, uh, but they are also formally verified. So formal verification if you come from a programming background, it's, it's like a very strong form of unit testing. It's just a way to guarantee that uh, the statements are true. And it's uh, commonly used as a benchmark for uh, automated theorem provers, for ATPs. And so among these uh, 58,000 theorems, you have many well-known theorems, including uh, Cauchy-Riemann, including uh, the Jordan curve theorem, and, uh, and many others that are uh, less well-known. So just a few words about uh, what first-order logic and uh, higher-order logic look like. So visually, that's what they look like. Here you have first-order logic, higher-order logic. So the way to think about it is basically uh, with a programming analogy. You, th you can think of first-order logic as like the assembly of uh, formal reasoning, whereas higher-order logic is more like a, a fully-fledged programming language, a functional programming language with pure functions and types. So it's, uh, it's higher level, it's more flexible, it's more powerful, more expressive. It's also more difficult to manipulate. <coughs> and um, so the DeepMath project uh, essentially consisted in 
uh, taking an ATP, so in our case it was uh, an ATP called, uh, called uh, e-prover, and uh, to help it uh, in its uh, brute force search process uh, using deep learning. Um, and um, essentially the process is the following. So if you have a, a statement you want to prove, so a conjecture you want to prove, um, first you start with a fa fairly large set of uh, statements that you know are true. The first thing you need to do is uh, selecting among the statements that you know are true the statements that are going to be useful uh, in your proof. And you use these statements as a starting point in the brute force search process. So this is called premise selection. So a premise is where you start from. It's your you know, logical starting point. And um, currently, the state of the art is to use a, a very uh, basic form of uh, machine learning on top of uh, handcrafted heuristics. To, to do this uh, premise selection, to select a starting point to give to, uh, to e-prover. And uh, so currently this is done with uh, KNN, uh, so KNN's neighbors on top of handcrafted heuristics. And the assumption that we can do better using deep learning and uh, by also completely removing handcrafted features. So you can think of the task of premise selection as essentially uh, the very first step that uh, a mathematician would, um, would go through and trying to prove a theorem, is, it's like selecting uh, lemmas or selecting uh, axioms that are going to be important in proving the theorem. And so uh, when the mathematician does it, he's not actually uh, formally uh, uh, inferring anything. He's not really you know, applying formal logic. He's just uh, using his own intuition or her own intuition to select the right premises. So the way we solve the problem of uh, premise selection with, uh, with deep learning is essentially with uh, this uh, network architecture where, where we have two branches. So one branch will be used to turn uh, conjecture, so the theorem you're trying to prove, into a dense embedding, so into a vector. And the other branch does the same thing with uh, a candidate premise. Uh, and then you can uh, combine uh, both embeddings and train a classifier to output like a score of whether or not the premise is useful to prove the conjecture. And you can run such a network on uh, all available premises. And, uh, and then you take you know, the first top 10 most relevant premises, top 100 most relevant premises, and so on. And you feed that into your ATP as the starting point to try to prove the theorem. And you see if it, manage, if it manages to, to, to get somewhere. So this work was uh, presented in, uh, in an IPS paper, uh, Deep Math, Deep Sequence Models for Premise Selection. So, work done with uh, many uh, colleagues, colleagues at Google, including uh, also um, one non-Googler, Joseph Urban. Um, so we tried many, many different variants of this setup. Uh, we tried different networks for embedding the statements. We tried different ways of fitting the statements into the system and different classifiers as well. And uh, essentially what we found out was that recurrent networks do not perform very well. Uh, 1D carbonates perform best. Um, we also tried different things uh, for feeding the data into networks so you can either take a fairly naive approach and look at uh, first order logic statements and um, feed them into a network as a sequence of characters. You can also try to tokenize them into tokens that make sense and try to do a one heart encoding of the tokens, for instance, feed that into a network. But these approaches actually uh, they're very naive and they did not work very well compared to our baseline because our baseline used handcrafted features that were pretty advanced. And here we're just starting from uh, characters or tokens, so we're not going very far. So one thing we found that was pretty clever and that worked really well was to essentially embed tokens into some embedding space. And uh, we compute this embedding space by first training uh, a model, so this type of model essentially, uh, on, uh, on uh, statements and code the sequences of characters, right? And then um, when you have a token, you feed it into the uh, embedder network, uh, so train on uh, using, uh, using this architecture. Um, and, uh, and you essentially convert your sequence of tokens into a sequence of embedding vectors, each embedding vector coming from uh, the first order logic statement that defines the token that you're dealing with. Because when you're dealing with first order logic, every token you're manipulating has uh, itself uh, a first order logic definition. So it's a way to 
uh, leverage the recursivity of first order logic essentially to unroll it a little bit with an embedding space. So it turns out uh, this approach works well. So this is like a summary of our results. Uh, we have uh, character level approaches, token level approaches, or world level approaches, and then uh, this definition embedding uh, setup. And then we have different network architectures. So CNN, CNLLCM, and LLCM are essentially types of networks that we use to encode, um, to embed the statements. So as you can see, uh, just using uh, a character level CNN or, or CNN uh, um, uh, LSCM was actually uh, even worse. Just a character level CNN does not outperform uh, the KNN baseline on top of uh, pretty advanced uncrafted features. But if you use uh, definition embeddings, then we start significantly outperforming the baseline. So this beats um, the state of the art. We can prove um, uh, more CRMs that could be uh, uh, proven entirely automatically before. In particular, we can uh, provide uh, automated proofs for uh, CRMs that were never proved by an ATP before. So we already had proofs for these CRMs, but they were human-generated proofs. So one thing you can do to go even further is uh, close selection. So as, uh, as I was explaining, uh, when you're trying to prove a CRM, you're starting from um, a set of statements that are known to be true, and you are combining them together, right? And uh, when you're combining statements together, uh, you're creating new statements, and then you're adding them to um, like a bucket of clauses. So a clause is just a statement. And at the next step, what you're going to do is essentially select uh, one of your existing clauses, which are statements that are known to be true and that are known to be uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, that can be inferred from your initial axioms. And you are going to uh, combine it, uh, combine one clause with uh, other existing clauses to generate new clauses, right? And um, the problem of clause selection is knowing uh, which clauses uh, should be selected, right? So it's very similar to premise selection. The difference is that in premise selection, you are selecting a starting point. With clause selection, uh, you are uh, trying to rank your unprocessed clauses at every inference step. So it's, uh, it's, much, it's, it's like a continuous process. Instead of just giving the, providing the ATP with a starting point, you are continuously guiding it. So this is work that was presented in um, an LPAR paper, uh, Deep Network Guided Proof Search. It's on archive, you can check it out. And um, to do that with deep learning, uh, again, we use a very similar architecture as we did with the initial uh, deep math paper. So we have a true branch uh, embedding network uh, that ends with a, a classifier. And um, uh, so my colleagues tried uh, many different architectures, uh, including the, the architectures that worked well for uh, premise selection. Um, and uh, it turned out uh, the best performing architectures were also similar to what worked best for premise selection. It's one decarbonates. Uh, it turns out also that uh, using dilated uh, kernels in your one decarbonate works better. So, uh, which is uh, what we call WaveNet. So, you know, WaveNet was a, a deep mind paper about um, uh, a generative model for voice and sound. So, it was just essentially a one decarbonate with dilated kernels. Um, so there's just one problem with this setup, which is speed. Uh, if you're using uh, this network to evaluate a close, it's roughly 1,000 times uh, slower. So it takes 1,000 times more time uh, than combining uh, the close you're trying to evaluate with all uh, available closes, right? So it's, uh, it's dramatically slower than brute force. So the way to think about it is that uh, this deep learning model provides you with um, a much higher quality search process, like a much wiser search process. You are selecting your clauses in a very smart way, but at the same time, you are moving very, very slowly, right? And um, the way to, to deal with it is essentially with uh, what we came up with, the two-phase process. So first, we leverage both our uh, deep networks and existing heuristics. Uh, to get a, a pretty smart search process. And when we get closer to a solution, so we are more advanced in the, in the proof process, we actually drop uh, the really slow uh, deep neural network evaluation and we just keep the heuristics. So essentially we have a trade-off between speed and search quality. And when you are early in the search process, 
it's better to privilege uh, search quality because essentially um, your, 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 your search space is combinatorial. So it's, uh, it's a good idea to make smart choices in the beginning. And uh, when you get closer to the end, uh, then brute force is uh, an increasingly valid approach. And so that's why you can uh, actually drop uh, this, uh, this higher uh, search quality module, this intuition module. <coughs> So this is where, these were uh, the results. Uh, here we are comparing uh, many different architectures. So surprisingly, uh, uh, three networks, three LSTM, did not work very well. Uh, the networks that worked best were actually the one decom net, so just like uh, premise selection, just like bitmath one. Uh, and uh, one way to uh, get even better results was actually to use uh, larger convolution windows uh, with dilated kernels, so the so-called wave net. Um, and um, the good thing is that uh, these two approaches, so DeepMath 1, so uh, using deep learning to solve premise selection, and DeepMath 2, using deep learning to solve closed selection, they are complementary approaches. So you can actually run them together. You can select both the starting point for your, for your ATP, and then you can guide the ATP during the proof search process, which is a two-phase hybrid approach where you start by uh, uh, essentially uh, guiding uh, the network, um, guiding the, the, the ATP 50% of the time. And when you get closer to, uh, to the solution, you start just relying on brute force. So uh, by leveraging uh, both approaches at the same time, uh, we end up proving many more theorems. So in parallel, we end up proving uh, many theorems that before did not have any uh, ATP generated proof and only had uh, human generated proofs. So, uh, this is still a very, very basic, very pre pre preliminary approach. Um, this is essentially just uh, taking uh, existing uh, deep learning sequence processing models, applying them to uh, um, first order logic uh, statements, so sequence data, uh, getting scores out of them. This is not very smart. So I think if we want to uh, uh, carry on in this direction, we need to move to higher order logic. So again, uh, the programming analogy between first order logic and higher order logic is that first order logic is closer to like the assembly of uh, formal reasoning and uh, higher order logic is more like a programming language. So in order to um, uh, try to uh, speed things up, try to catalyze research around uh, using machine learning for higher order logic, uh, theorem proving, uh, we released a data set called uh, whole step, so whole for higher order logic. So that was an, an uh, iClear paper, whole step, machine learning data set for higher order logic theorem improving. You can check it out on archive, you can also download the data. So it's a data set of triplets of higher order logic statements. So uh, in one triplet, you have essentially um, one conjecture, so something that you're trying to prove. You have one statement that is a proof step that turned out to be useful. Uh, that turned out to be included in the final proof to prove the conjecture. And you have uh, one negative example, which is essentially uh, a higher order logic statement that was generated during the proof search, but that turned out to not be useful, to not uh, be included in the final proof. So of course, if you can tell the difference between a useful statement with regard to conjecture and a non-useful statement, then you can be very, very good at, uh, at close selection. And you can also be very good at uh, premise selection, obviously, because it's a very similar problem to close selection. And you can do even, uh, even more. You can also try to reverse the problem. Like given uh, some proof steps, uh, what should be um, the conjecture? So do, do things like uh, conjecturing. And you can also try to uh, uh, not just try to rank existing statements, but try to generate statements, try to predict what the next proof step should be. So many, many tasks uh, that you can try. Um, it's, um, it's very amenable to machine learning, so you can uh, uh, search for it, download it, uh, publish papers about it. All right, so to wrap up my talk, uh, what you should take away is that uh, one big and sole problem in AI today is abstraction and reasoning. And our current approach uh, with deep learning, machine learning, is really just doing uh, pattern matching. So it's not attacking abstraction or reasoning at all. But attacking these problems is going to be hugely important on the way to AI. And uh, we think that uh, mathematics is a great playground to try new approaches to tackle abstraction and reasoning. And there is no way to do well 
uh, with essentially just pattern matching when you are when you are attacking uh, mathematics. And we are um, proposing like a template for in general uh, <coughs> leveraging abstraction and reasoning uh, um, in uh, in mathematical problems, which is to take an existing uh, formal reasoning system, an existing proof search system, and to augment it with an intuition module provided by deep learning, so provided by pattern matching. So essentially, you take symbolic AI, but you give the symbolic AI system some intuition with regard to the meaning of the symbols it's manipulating. And so this intuition and meaning, it's all, it's all pattern matching. So really the combination of uh, abstract models with intuition, and uh, of course, that's a very, very uh, pre pre preliminary step. Uh, in the future, you can imagine that uh, AI will, uh, will be able to come up with its own uh, formal reasoning systems, with its own search strategies, uh, with its own abstract models. But uh, for now, we just take hard-coded abstract models, augment them with intuition. Um, and so our deep math project was, uh, was pretty successful. Uh, we managed to prove uh, a significant number of new CRMs, so not CRMs that uh, were not proven before, but theorems that were not proven automatically before, but were only proven by humans. And uh, the next step is to go from just processing first order logic to processing higher order logic. Uh, this also has implications for artificial programming. Uh, if you're good at processing higher order logic, you're also going to be good at the genetic programs, for instance. And uh, you can uh, actually take part uh, in this research uh, because we made available this uh, higher, higher order logic uh, proof step, uh, data set, whole step, which you can download. So that's it for me, and uh, I'll be taking a few questions. Hi, first of all, thank you very much for the talk. It's uh, incredibly interesting. Uh, to give you a bit of background, I work in automatic programming with deep learning. And I was particularly interested to see the results on first order logic, WaveNet versus tree-based LSTMs. Because particularly as you start moving to more higher order logic and taking back the analogy to source code where at the end you can bring everything back to abstract syntax trees. Why do you think WaveNet outperforms uh, versus tree-based LSTMs? And do you think it will continue to do so as you move more towards higher order logic? So I think, so the statements we're manipulating are fundamentally uh, recursive. And leveraging this recursive structure seems hugely important. But in practice, uh, we found so far that trying to leverage it has not worked. It does not mean it's not important. It's just we have not currently managed to make it work. I do believe that uh, we should keep investigating uh, tree-shaped uh, uh, tree networks. I do believe we need to take into account recursivity. So currently, I think the reason is just that uh, as, a pattern match, as a pattern matching uh, system for uh, long sequences, WaveNet uh, just works better. But it's, it seems to be more like a, a technical issue intuitively. Like conceptually, it's very clear that leverage and recursivity is, a, is the right way to, to approach this. Do one more question. Do I have a question? Oh, one right here. Uh, do you have any plans for participating in any uh, theorem prover competitions? Sorry, what? Uh, do you have any plans for comp uh, participating in uh, one of the theorem prover competitions? Participating in, in what? Uh, theorem proving competitions. Oh yeah, uh, possibly. Yes, it's not. It's not our priority. Our priority is just to explore the space, come up with interesting approaches. Um, the thing is, uh, theorem proving competitions are not. It's, it's, it's very niche, right? So it's not going to be interesting to a lot of people. And the uh, people that will be interested in it are not actually people who, uh, I would say, share our vision of uh, trying to leverage deep learning for serial improving. So. Okay. I think we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you very much.